Lincoln by Martin Wallace. This is a card driven war game, or I should say Euro war game, that depicts the American Civil War at the strategic level, at a fairly high level of abstraction, but at the same time, as you will see, with a good historical feel, with good historical flavor in the general overall management of the events. The game is not out yet, it is on Kickstarter right now, which is why I need to add a disclaimer or an explanation. The video you're watching is a preview in the sense and only in the sense that it is about a game that is not available yet preview but it is a review in the sense that it is a video in which I show how the game works and then I share my personal and completely unbiased opinions. I did, I put this disclaimer because a lot of videos out there that have paid content, uh, the, uh, the, the maker of the video is paid to give a general overview of the video and then withdrawing personal opinions or to give you sort of like a thinly disguised advertisement. That's not what I'm doing here. I'll tell you what I think about the game. My videos are unpaid and opinionated. So two player game, Players will play cards uh, to um, to deploy units, to influence the political situation, to influence uh, the blockade around the North American continent, and they will continue like this until key locations have been lost or taken, until different events happen so that that will trigger victory for one of the two players. Two-player game only, not really good for solitaire play because the bluffing element, the secret information element is pretty relevant. Without further ado, let's see how the game works. Here you see the board of the game, which is simple looking, but nice, clean, very functional from the point of view of the connections. As you can see, it is a point to point map. Maybe if you played a few acres of snow, that looks familiar, but that is also something very common in war games and especially in card driven war games for some reason. So we have locations that are connected to one another by railroads and they are divided each location in two areas. This is sort of unusual. The rule book tells us that when you are alone in a location it doesn't really matter in which of the two halves of a location you are. And when an opponent arrives and attacks you they will go in the half of the location related to the connection they're coming from and you the defender will come and will go and join them it's not that important where you're at the beginning because you always go where the fight is and then things may happen for example there may be a fight there you may choose to withdraw which is a delaying technique <clears throat> But there is this mechanic here based on the on each location div being divided into areas. Some locations are worth victory points, uh, but only for the Union player, which is why they are facing that way. The Confederate player does not score points, but wins by capturing objectives and or by delaying the Union player for long enough. Some locations are supply sources, very important. Some locations have defensive values that are applied to the defender, the is attacked there and some location or ports um, by playing certain cards it is possible to move directly from one port area to another uh, which is a special kind of movement. According to the rulebook, Washington is a port location too, although there doesn't seem to be anything to indicate that. Speaking of, of the defense values, interesting that uh, a, a same location may have different defensive values depending on the connection that the attacker uses to get there. Entering or trying to enter Washington from here gives a plus four to the defender from here only plus two. So there is an interesting element of strategy there. Here on the side we have two tracks. This is the blockade track. The players will spend cards to move the blockade marker. The Union player will try to move it down. The Confederate player to move it back up. In certain locations the placement of the marker will give victory points to the Union player as you can see from that, those numbers there. The number on the other side on the left is the hand size of the Confederate player. The Union player always has six cards in their hand but the maximum size for the 
Confetti player depends on the intensity of the blockade. So he starts at five and he may go down to three, which would be pretty bad. Also, the South is trying to convince European politicians to uh, enter the war or at least to negotiate a peace that will include a separation between the North and South. So they're trying to impress the Europeans. When, by winning battles and by eliminating enemy units, you will move the marker up and down towards your side if you're the Union and you're doing well, towards your side, which is this way, if you're the Confederate player and you're destroying a lot of enemy units and eliminating and eliminating enemy units and winning battles. And also there may be game effects that simply pull the marker up and down. If the marker ever goes here, the confederate player wins the game. Uh, victory conditions. The confederate player wins by winning a political victory, may win by taking Washington, which makes perfect sense. Also, as <clears throat> uh, you will see, players will use decks of cards and the Union player may reshuffle the deck of cards twice. The third time that the Union player goes to their deck, uh, instead of reshuffling a third time, the game is over. If at that point the Union player doesn't have a certain number of points, then the Confederate player wins. Actually, at each reshuffle, the Union player must have a number of points. Before reshuffling the first time, the Union player must have two points. Before shuffling the second time, five points. So basically, there is a schedule, and the Confederate player wins at the end of one go through of the Union deck by the Union player. If the Union player at that point, at the time of reshuffling, doesn't have enough victory points. The Union player basically wins by surviving long enough by meeting the calendar of, of victory points. Also, the board here tells us that the Union player wins uh, by controlling Vicksburg and Richmond. There is no indication of this in the rule book, but to me it makes sense. So I, I we ruled that this board is right and the rule book is wrong in that sense. This is a card driven game, each player starts with a unique deck of cards uh, that has different cards, different abilities and the composition of the cards mirrors the abilities and the skills and challenges of the two sides in different phases of the conflict. You will have your hand of cards, when it is your turn you can take two actions, most actions will require the playing of a card and after you play your card, uh, your cards, card or cards, some cards will be discarded to activate their effect and some of the cards to activate their effect will be removed from the game entirely. So as the game progresses, as the game progresses, you will have a discard pile, a number of cards that are removed and so on and so forth. So you play two actions, most of them will require spending cards, then you refill your hand up to your maximum up to your maximum value and you continue like this until you have to reshuffle at the point your deck will not be the same as it was before because of all the cards that you were forced to remove and when you need to reshuffle the first time you take these cards here from this mini deck marked as one and you shuffle them in and you repeat the procedure when then you have to reshuffle again you take the cards from the mini deck number two and you reshuffle it again the confederate player will keep shuffling and reshuffling until the end of the game. The union player has the same set of one main deck and two mini decks, but the confederate, the, the union player can only reshuffle twice. Once to add this one, once to add this one, when going through the deck the last time, the third time, then at the end of that of that going through the deck the game is over. And I love this idea of the two decks because they have different abilities. <coughs> The Union player is much better at building units. Early on, the Confederate player has vastly superior leadership and training and organization and the ability to get uh, the high ground, to use defensive cards, to reinforce at the last minute. So there is just tactical superiority versus material superiority. Right there, there's a lot of personality and historical flavor that is hardwired in the decks. Then, with the mini decks, uh, that uh, gradually you really have a sense of the historical arc because as the game progresses, the Union deck becomes stronger and stronger, and the Confederate deck becomes weaker and weaker, both because of the good cards that when you 
uh, removed to activate their effects, then they are out, you cannot use them for anything else, and also because these cards are increasingly worse, uh, they will tend to clutter your hand. A card such as this one, as you will see after I show it to you, is really bad, and it's even the worst one. <coughs> So you really have the um, the changing economic conditions later on in the game when these two decks are added becomes very hard for the confederate player to move. So very interesting narrative here, all ingrained in the in the cards. Now, what do you do with the cards? Well, when you play a card you can activate one of the things that is on it, only one. <coughs> here on top you have you have uh, the possibility of deploying units or influencing the political track of building of, of influencing the blockade or building a fort. The competitive player builds a lot more forts, so we'll look for that one here. Where is it? Here is the fort. Basically, to play a card, to activate the effect on top, you see there is a number of cards next to the icon. That is the number of cards you need to discard. So here, for, to deploy this unit, which would be a two-strength military unit, I remove this card from the game, and I discard one card as the cost in my discard pile, and then I can deploy this in an area that is friendly to me, that I control. Uh, a one unit, an army unit, level one, does not require any expenditure and also is not removed from the game. This is the exception, so you can always build a one unit by discarding a card with a level one unit on it. But again, other cards here you need to discard two and again remove the one that you're using to activate. By discarding one and removing this card, you affect the political track by one. Here you get to deploy a fort, which will give you a defensive ability. And as for some of the other abilities, for example, you can force the opponent to discard cards. You may gain the high ground, which is a card that you play during combat to influence your defense value. The reinforcement card is super powerful because it lets you reinforce as the last second in a battle from an adjacent location. That means that the opponent thinks that they have that they have victory and then guess what? They don't. You can also play a card instead of using this one. You can use a card for movement. This is rail movement. When you use rail movement, you can move all the units in a location to an adjacent connected location or one unit anywhere, any distance on the board as long as you're moving through legal connections, so through locations that you control. Then again, a card can be played for its effect, and some of these effects will count as an action. Remember, you have two actions per game, uh, per round, and some of the cards are free actions, so you play, uh, you use the effect, and then you still have uh, as many actions as you had before. And then here we have a leadership value. That is, well, let's look at the board before we talk about combat and how you use that. Combat may start in one of two ways. It may be that a player enters a un an uncontested location that contains units of the opponent, in which case combat is triggered and resolved immediately. It may also be that a location contains units belonging to both sides in the two different halves of a location and they were there from a previous round, from a previous phase of the game. In which case, one of the two players can spend an action to trigger combat against the opponent. As opposed to when you're moving in, then combat is a function or a result, an effect of movement. When you attack, either because you declare combat as an action in a, in a contested location or you enter a new location, when you uh, declare combat, you play a card from your deck face down, pay attention to the leadership value, which will be added as a modifier. At that point, the defender has several options. In such a situation, when you were just attacked, you may choose to withdraw, in which case you simply move to the other half of the location, combat doesn't happen, this card is discarded. It's a particularly powerful delaying technique. Or you can choose to stay and fight. If you choose to stay and fight, then you can choose to play a leader card too, uh, face down or then simply not to do anything. Say, no, I'm good, I'll defend with what I have right now. But suppose that the Confederate player decides to stay there, fight and defend. 
Uh, this is pretty much the basic idea. So then players can also play other cards, other combat cards such as reinforcement that allows the confederate player to reinforce from an adjacent location. Suppose this is the situation, the confederate player plays this card and now the confederate player is adding that to the battle, particularly nasty. There is a high ground card that gives you a defense of if you or I'll give you an advantage if you're defending a fort will give a bonus of three to the uh, defender so basically you add together the strength of your units plus modifiers that may come from forts cards some locations have intrinsic defensive modifiers as we saw you add together units modifiers and the leadership value of the two and the leadership value of each side. The player that has the highest total wins the battle. If there is a tie, the defender wins the battle. Then both players lose half of their units. It's based the loss is based on number of units, not strength of the units. So sometimes having a bunch of little guys that can take of like one what value one units that can take a hit could be good. Uh, the defender loses half of their units rounded down, the attacker loses half of their units rounded up. However, you cannot the attacker cannot lose more units than the defender. And right there, so we got a bunch of losses here. For example, if this side loses, this side would be forced to lose one of the units, and this side would lose half of the units rounded down, but none more. Then the attacker lost. Then we adjust things politically, and this is very important. When you win a battle, you move the political marker a number of spaces on the track towards your side by a number of spaces equal to the number of units that you destroyed. So if the union attacks uh, uh, and has a catastrophic, uh, catastrophic battle and loses four units, for example, as you can see, we're getting close already here. Then maybe the Confederate player plays another a card that influences things that way and so now the union player needs some political action or some desperate uh, powerful victory otherwise there will be a confederate victor victory right there also the confederate player moves the political marker by taking control of uh, of blue areas blue areas that are designated as blue at the beginning of the game that's an extra advantage for moving north it gives you particularly powerful political uh, credit i guess this is pretty much the game. Play your cards, activate your units, move around, build forts, uh, uh, get resources from everywhere, move around this net of bottlenecks, uh, trying to inflict losses on the opponent and trying to push your way to valuable locations and continue like this until one of the players has met the victory conditions. Now, when I saw this game, I was very curious about it because it reminded me of A Few Acres of Snow, a game that I liked very much. This game, like that one, is card-driven, point-to-point map, it depicts a large event, same designer. So I enjoyed A Few Acres of Snow and I wanted to play this one too. However, A Few Acres of Snow is now pretty well known for a problem in the strategy. There is a winning strategy called the Halifax Hammer that, if implemented correctly, makes it very hard for the other player to win. Win. And I regret that when I filmed my review of A Few Acres of Snow, I hadn't picked it up after playing the game a couple of times, I hadn't realized that that was a possibility. So in the back of my mind the idea was like, ooh, Lincoln, but I hope it's as good as that one without uh, any problem of that kind. I hope it doesn't have the Manassas hammer problem. Uh, which, guess what? It does. It does. So what I'm gonna do now is to tell you why the first time that we played the game, I loved it. I had a blast. I thought it was gonna become one of my favorite games, instant classic. Then we played the game again and a very strong sudden strategy emerged. And we started scratching our head. We're like, wait a second, how do you counteract that? And we played the game five more times. So basically I played the game seven times. One was this long epic thing with a very tough uh, tough earned union victory. And then we played six times, but these were shorter because the Southern player always won before the first union reshuffling. Sometimes by taking control of Washington and some of the times simply by preventing the union player from getting two points before uh, reshuffling the deck. We switched side and we talked and this 
discussed it, analyzed, that seemed to be basically almost no way for the Northern player to win once a competitive player realizes what they're doing and understands the strategy. First, the good stuff, which I hope is what we will be able to enjoy once the other problem is fixed. It's great if there is a way of restoring balance. As if, if this game was balanced, then you have so much meat, you have so much, so many historical events, so many historical factors to take into account. You have very tough decisions, hand management becomes an act of virtuosity because you have to decide which cards you use now and for a very mighty effect and they're gone forever, which means you don't use them for their main effect, of course, but there are other effects connected that you're giving up if you use the card to build a unit. Maybe there is a three level army, very good, but then there is a really nice leadership bonus there. So if you build a unit, you're never gonna have that bonus. Then I'm gonna maybe build a lower unit and I hope that that card comes back. Well, it will come back, so I still have it for later. Or simply don't play it now, I keep it in my hand. So you have this very long term objective of keeping your deck as healthy as possible. The immediate objective of having a good hand, of doing things that you need to do on the board, and maybe building up some powerful combos, especially for the Union. The Union starts with very poor leadership values, with not many cards that influence uh, combat. The Union can build huge armies at the beginning very easily, but by doing that you're burning through your deck very quickly. And also, you're building armies and not advancing, and the pressure at the beginning is on the Union player. Uh, basically, I like how the composition of the decks and the victory conditions create this very interesting situation in which to win the battle, to win the war, the Union player needs to win it, but the Confederate player only needs not to lose it. If the Confederate player doesn't lose, then that player wins. Uh, that means as a Union player you want to build up your armies, take your time and then advance. But if you do so, probably you won't have time to, uh, to get enough objectives to get those two victory points and you lose before the first reshuffling. So that means that you will have the, dile the dilemma of attacking a little too early, but when is not too early. So basically you're launching maybe some suicidal attacks at the Union player because you have to advance but then by doing so you're losing units which means you're getting in trouble politically. So you're juggling a lot of things. You have a timer that goes against you because as the more stuff you do the thinner your deck becomes and the confederate player doesn't have that problem even by weakening the deck the first time the confederate player goes through the deck uh, the second time is still not that bad so you have to move fast at the union player and you have to launch these attacks just to weaken the opponent and then you launch repeated ones and that's how you actually make progress but if you do so then you're losing you're losing ground on the political track. So there are just so many ways of losing the game. And the most dangerous thing, of course, is that you cannot act too much in the Western theater because of the threats that is always looming against Washington. So, the first time that we played the game in which the Confederate player didn't know all that that was possible to do, we had such a blast. I really had the sense that we were right there, there was a strong historical feel, a strong sense of historical progression, and both sides always felt on the verge of catastrophe. The Union player always made it to the checkpoints at the last turn or the one last before it was too late great sense of tension and the confederate player uh, was always holding on to some key locations at risk of losing richmond or atlanta very important because they're supply sources without those you cannot reinforce which then for the you for this confederate player means just to get slowly and painfully strangled it just just was this strong sense of tension on both sides the sense of catastrophe may hit uh, either player at any moment. The, the Confederates may just start crumbling because of lack of resources or the Union player may suffer a political blow that will change the political, um, international political uh, situation and bring a defeat. I love the sense of tension, I love the decisions that came from hand management and I loved then bluffing, the bluffing, the, 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 the military element, the proper quintessential wargamey element, put up a 
set up a powerful attack, launch it there, use a card to trick your opponent, but then you know that your opponent is gonna delay to refuse combat, so actually now I'm looking like I'm preparing a mighty attack, I'm using a leadership card which is not that great, you withdraw, so I waste it, but now I have another combo that I saved uh, that I can launch there. So there is a lot of like meta gaming, but in the healthy sense of I think that you're thinking that I'm thinking that we're thinking I don't know what you're thinking. I'm still trying to trick you. Uh, I loved all of that. I love the economic element and the military element and now everything fits together. That's how much fun I had uh, during the first game and I thought this is instant class is gonna be one of my favorite games. Until we discovered the second game, the the Manassas Hammer. The Manassas Hammer. Um, uh, maybe if I show you, if I show you the map, is easier to understand what I what I mean. Basically, in conclusion, I'm gonna show you the map and show you how what, what the problem is for us. But if you don't have time, this is my idea. This is a great game, but the second, the third time that you play, the Southern player will figure out what to do, and there just seems to be no way of of winning the game for the Union player to survive the first checkpoint, the first shuffle, and that's that's fatal. That's fatal to me because then what is the point of uh, or playing a game that you know the Union player will not will not survive. Um, the game needs to be <coughs> polished, needs some other sort of like changes. As is, there's just an obvious winning strategy which deprives the game of any of any joy. So uh, that's that's my pretty much my assessment. The Confederate player will almost always win. We played it six times trying to beat that strategy. A friend of mine and I we're pretty serious gamers if we couldn't find a strategy to win then either is not there or it's very hard to find which is still it's much harder than it should be now uh thank you for following if this is all you had time towards that's fine otherwise if you want to know more i'll show you more in detail what the problem is with the manassas hammer Okay, so basically, as you see from the map, we have a Western theater of operation with one main connection here and two paths here, and then an add of paths to separate Richmond from Washington. The Union player needs to conquer victory points, and so the burden of the attack is on the Union player. The Union player starts with units here and here, and there are Confederate units here and here, and then we have Union units here and Confederate player units here. So basically, we have a front. Anywhere that player goes needs to build, the Union player needs to build a powerful army and go through and push their way to take control either here of New Market or, which is two points, so that would be okay if you control that one location by your first reshuffle, or two of the following location, Fredericksburg, Nashville, and or Corin. Two out of three uh, because those are only one point each. Now, technically, you could use a naval action to land in one of these ports that are worth two points, but a naval action, you can only move one army, there are good defensive values, good uh, confederate units in here, and at the beginning, remember, the military deck for the Union player is much weaker. So, with equal numbers, because of the good modifiers that the Confederate player has, with equal numbers, the Union player will always lose. At least in the first phases of the game, when you need to get two points to be able to survive. So, pretty much in the early phases of the game, a naval attack is not feasible. You need to mount a mighty attack. You need to have vast numerical superiority. Tying numerically or even having a good superiority is simply not enough. Again, because you have leadership cards with a value of two or three, the opponent has values of four and five, a lot of them, defensive cards, reinforcements, good defensive bonuses. So uh, you need to mount enormous attacks to be able to push through and lose a lot of units, which means as the Union player, you may not have time to do so. You build all those attacks, you build those armies, and by the time they're big enough, you don't have time to push through because the opponent can still delay you by withdrawing and retreating, then withdrawing again, then retreating, then withdrawing again, and you spend a lot of suicidal attacks just to get one point. So the opponent uh, can delay you as the Union player, you can build large armies, or you're going in with suicidal attacks, so weakening the opponent, and then hoping to rebuild faster, and then attack the weakened force, and rebuild and continue like this. But it also takes time, and also has a political 
at all. So basically, if you're just playing it cautious, this is for the ability of toll. Think you play it uh, with caution with the Union Army, you are gonna lose because you don't have time to attack. You attack a little too early, well, then you lose politically, or in any case, then you the time runs out before you can rebuild your armies. Also, Washington. Washington is constantly <coughs> under <coughs> attack or threat from the Manassas, hence the Manassas, the Manassas hammer. You start with units here and you cannot ignore Washington. Actually, we, we figured out the Union player pretty much has to enforce Washington the first turn. You spend the first turn, at least one of the two actions, to build units in Washington. If you don't, it's very possible, we try several times, it's very possible that the Confederate player wins in round one by simply uh, building a unit here and then by launching a big attack uh, and, that's, and that's all it takes. If the Confederate player builds a big unit here, launches an attack, uses a mighty card and maybe uses, uh, uses again a mighty leadership that may be all that that it takes. So the first turn, the Union player must must reinforce Washington, uh, which already is a flaw. If it's something that you must do, otherwise you always lose. That should be part of setup already. The game should start a little later. It should start from a turn where players immediately have interesting decisions to make. But that's a minor thing. The problem is that. By building there instead of anywhere else, you're already a little bit behind the curve. Because remember, you need to break through something. It's not enough to reinforce Washington. You have to break through one of these locations here. To get to this area, you need to break through very defended locations. Pretty much unthinkable. So as you're building your units, so you spend your turn building some units here. Maybe one here and one there. You're building up your attack. And guess what the Confederate player does? Reinforces there and there. Okay, then I'm gonna build more strength here and more strength there. And the Confederate player enforces there and there. Basically always behind, uh, one step behind in the curve, the Confederate player only needs to build where you are. Not even that actually. The Confederate player, after a while, when the Confederate player has built a not strong, an okay defense here, then he's piling up units here. Because at this point, even if the Union player has built up enough strength here and breaks through here and scores a point and breaks another one, would make it to the reshuffling, yay! You lose by losing Washington. In fact, you can have a big breakthrough here. The Confederate player may take control, uh, the Union player may take control of all of this area, but to do so, then you have lost Washington, you have lost the game. So basically, the Manassas Hammer, as we call it, is respond to build ups, the build ups in the west the first turn or two just to make sure that they can't break through too much or too easily and that keep piling up units here and a little bit here but here's all you need to do not only that there you can build up a strong a massive uh, force here as the confederate player and a good defense here the confederate player has a card called reinforcement you place a level three army here and a level three army here whenever you attack you play the reinforcement card to move the three to the other location and that's having like a double three six points in both locations plus the defensive bonus plus the fact that the defender wins ties um it's all um, plus the fact that you can delay you're attacking me here you spend all your resources fine boop i withdraw then you mount another attack and then i use my reinforcement meanwhile i went through my deck and maybe got other defensive cards i combo them i devastate you here you probably weaken washington to launch an attack and i win by taking washington pretty much you besiege washington and it becomes after six tries, it seems to be impossible for the Union player to make it past the first reshuffling. Either you lose by losing Washington if you try to get your points, or you try to be strong in Washington and break through somewhere else, and then you simply don't have the time to do so um, because, uh, because then you need to reshuffle and you spend so many resources in Washington that we are not able to push all the way down here, get into location, or here, and here, or here. This 
in a nutshell, is the Manassas, uh, Manassas hammer. There is another thing that we tried, completely unhistorical, and that bothered me in fact that we tried it. It is the one that got the, the Union player closer to almost not losing, which is you have a massive army here, a, defense, a good defense here as the Union player, and then you empty Washington and you launch everybody here. It just... Is repugnant to the mind just the idea of Washington completely depleted. But, uh, well, let's just say that that didn't help the Confederate player win. It gave the illusion that it was maybe possible then to break through and take control of this one. And then from there, getting, getting here and getting these two points by the first reshuffling. But again, then either you leave a strong defense here or the Confederate will get there. And with that Dawn reinforcement card so that anywhere you're attacking the Confederate player can reinforce from an next area. So the Confederate player can get immediately to Washington so easily from there. But for the uh, for the Union player to get to, to a supply source, you have to go through hell and back. Uh, all that made even that strategy, the Blitzkrieg, the, the, uh, maybe the, the big, the Washington Gambit, throw everybody out of Washington, even that didn't work. The Blitzkrieg uh, stopped, uh, lost momentum, and then the Union player was stuck here, and again, either the Union player uh, lost Washington, or getting stuck here, well, the Union player got stuck there, and then was spending car rebuilding here, rebuilding defenses, and again, time ran out. This is the Manassas hammer. Build up units here. Keep constant pressure against the, against the Union. Save uh, high leadership cards, uh, high ground cards, uh, defensive card, reinforcement cards in your hand as the Confederate player. Keep an okay, not even very good defense in the West. Uh, respond to what the Union player does. And six times that we tried this out of six, uh, well, the Confederate player won and the Union player lost. And this is the problem. And this is the problem why a game that has so much potential as is, as is to me is virtually now, um, I don't, don't say unplayable, but there really isn't much of a reason to play it. I hope it's fixed in the future, probably is, but again, some work uh, needs to be done. If you're buying the game now, you're doing it on fate, uh, hoping that they will fix this, or hoping also that I'm wrong. Hey, if I'm mistaken, please tell me. I will not be mad. Oh no, I have to be right every time. Oh, thank you, because if I'm mistaken, I mistook something, and I'm, and I'm wrong, and you're right, and the game is playable, hooray, because I can add a great game to my collection. As is, well, I'm w I'll wait for the game to be fixed, and maybe then I'll make another video uh, as an update. But as is, alas, uh, a design with all the potential that comes very close to be great, but as is, it just looks broken.